Hello and welcome to Mindful Biology. This is the first of five sessions about sensitivity. Sensitivity is a topic I'm excited to present because it's so important to our lives. Our bodies as biological organisms are sensitive to touch, but also sight, sound, scent, and so on. This sensitivity provides valuable information that makes it possible for us to survive and thrive. Of course, our sensitivity also underlies much that makes life feel rich and pleasurable, as well as some that leads to discomfort and what we might call suffering. So this is a rich topic for exploration, and I look forward to investigating it with you. We'll be focusing primarily on the sense of touch and the skin surface. Doing so will also involve considering the body's separation from the outside world, the ways in which we are isolated from our surroundings, but also the ways in which we are connected. So there's a lot to go through here, and I hope you will find the exploration as interesting and valuable as I have. If you've watched previous Mindful Biology programs, you know that the goal of the project is to help us use basic biological information to develop a greater sense of intimacy and connection with our bodies and our biological lives. Doing so requires a form of sensitivity. We need to be sensitive to our inner experience. Mindfulness as a practice also involves sensitivity to outward experience. In some sense, the difference between inside and outside is a little illusory because the body is acquiring information about interior states of the organs and the nervous system, etc., as well as outside circumstances through light and sound and scent, etc. All of this information comes together in the body and particularly in the nervous system, which then responds in ways that favor survival. So the question we'll be exploring in this series is, how does this sensitivity work? And in particular, we'll be looking at the various channels of information that come in, the various channels that we're sensitive to. So I'm using here this outmoded type of television set, such as was common during the 50s, 60s, and 70s of the last century. Televisions back then, as many of us remember, had antennae on the top, which we adjusted in order to pick up signals that were broadcast by local TV stations over the airwaves. Let's imagine for the moment that the television has just one channel and that we depend on that for all of our information. I think we know from the present day that over-reliance on a single channel of information tends to lead to distortion. Well, one of the most common channels that we use as organisms, as humans, is a particularly well-developed function in the human uh, body and mind, which is the brain and, in particular, a region of the brain known as the prefrontal cortex, which helps us analyze, use language, uh, develop concepts, and so on. I'm going to call this process, this function of the brain, the objectifier. As noted, it involves the prefrontal cortex, although it would be an oversimplification to say that it's all located there. But it is particularly characteristic of human as opposed to other animal intelligence. As far as we know, we're the only animals that use symbolic reasoning to a high degree and that therefore are capable of what we might call objective analysis. And so we are the only animals that have a well-developed objectifier function. Well, this objectifier is what we use when we look out upon the environment and see features that we name. For instance, we look out on a hillside and we see trees growing on it. And so we come up with the word tree to label these 
structures that we see in the distance that are tall and have branches and so on. Or we could take the whole collection of trees and label it a forest. Either way, we've created or defined a kind of object in our field of view, and then we can compare that object with other objects. We can track for changes over time. We can read online or elsewhere to get more information about that class of object, etc. So this is the power of the objectifier function. The objectifier is so skilled at picking out features and looking at them as if they were separate objects that it does so rather automatically. And one of the so-called objects that frequently comes under examination is the human body itself. So when we look at the human body through the lens of the objectifier, we of course get some information about it. As modern biology has progressed, this information has gotten ever more detailed and impressive so that we now know a tremendous amount about the human body, all of its different organs and cell types and so on. So the picture that gets built up can be quite detailed, but it's rather limited in range in the sense that the information is so verbal and conceptual. If we only examine the body in this way, we'll be missing a lot of what makes life rich and meaningful. We'll be missing the feeling of life, which of course is what tends to matter most to us. So we can add in additional channels that are part of our experience, some of which we are very familiar with and others, although always present, we may be somewhat out of touch with. In the subsequent series, we will look at these different channels. One refers to our animal or mammalian nature. So this is the direct feeling of hunger, thirst, pleasure, coolness, warmth, desire, affection, etc. All of the feelings that pass through a mammalian organism. Obviously, we're quite in touch with these. And we will, in this series, look at ways to become more comfortably and at home uh, in this experience of mammalian life. Another layer of experience is something that could be called cellular. It's often referred to as energetic the overall sense of aliveness. And yet another is the quality of being embedded in a much larger field of the biosphere and the universe. These latter two channels are probably less familiar to most of us, but they are part of our ongoing experience and they can be uh, cultivated so that we are more in touch with them. And that will be one of our goals in this series. As we move through these different channels and add them to our repertoire, we get a richer and more colorful experience. And that's one of the advantages of this kind of exploration. Well, there are a lot of ways we could divide human experience into channels. The one I just outlined is a useful one. We'll be employing it to advantage in this series, but there are certainly others, and there are some that we're more familiar with. For instance, there are the five senses of touch, sight, hearing, smell, and taste. These senses are quite familiar to us and we're used to thinking of them as separate channels. And so they'll be a good place for us to begin working with this idea of channels of experience. In addition to the sensory channels, we have an ongoing sense of awareness or attention or consciousness that can be focused onto the different channels at will. So we can choose to focus on a visual scene or to attend to a conversation or some music in the distance or to feel something that we're holding in our hands or to taste something that was just put upon our plate or to scent the air for a new and unfamiliar aroma, etc. We're able to effectively move our awareness or our attention at will to pick up these different channels and focus on them according to the needs of the moment. This is unsurprising. It's just a part of daily life, but it's worth reminding ourselves that we have this capacity to choose and shift attentional focus. 
Well, why do we have these sense organs in the first place? I mean, the answer is probably obvious. They provide information about the outside world. But we have th this body that is separated from the world by the skin surface that we'll be examining. And the sense organs, of course, allow us to bring in information from the exterior, the so-called outside, and incorporate it into our ongoing inner experience of consciousness, which feels rather personal and private and intimate to ourselves, as opposed to the outside world, which is more public and shared, etc. So the sense organs and the skin allow us to get information about the world outside and build up an experience of it on the inside, in consciousness. And this is you know, the basis, then, of a lot of sensitivity. So we have this tremendous sensitivity to features of the outside world. Of course, we also have a sensitivity to inner aspects of life, such as states of hunger and so on. When it comes to the world, we are immersed in it. So it's not just something that's off to the side, as previously shown. It surrounds us. And there's an enormous amount happening out there. And one function of our sensitivity is to pare down the information flow and to make it manageable so that we can take the vast world outside and experience a more limited aspect of it on the inside, specifically the aspect that matters most to our survival in a given moment. So with the senses, then, the five channels, we can move our awareness at will and sort of shift from one to the next in order to get a feel for how attention can be managed. And this will serve us well as we move into those other layers of experience that I mentioned at the outset that have to do with how the body is viewed objectively, its mammalian qualities, its cellular or energetic uh, aliveness, and so on. A nice meditation practice, then, can be to first focus on the visual environment and take in some level of detail, then move attention to the audible world, the sounds in the distance and up close, maybe the sounds of your own breathing, and then shift to odors and aromas and taste and the sense of touch, and just move your attention to these different senses to get a feel for how easy it is to shift attention from one channel of experience to another. You know, this is nothing new or surprising, but it's helpful to begin to get the feel for how we can choose which channel to tune into. So I encourage you to develop that as a meditation practice. Well, as mentioned, there are a lot of different ways that bodily experience can be divided into different channels or layers. One that I was exposed to during my yoga training was the kosha system. So the koshas are often referred to as sheaths. And with this system, the body is viewed as having multiple, usually five layers that involve different aspects of our bodily experience, the physical, the energetic, the mental, something more like uh, wisdom or clarity, and a background uh, sense of bliss, a kind of uh, pure awareness, as it were. If you're familiar with the yoga tradition, you've probably encountered the koshas, you may have heard them described differently. The main point here is that there is a system within the yoga tradition that divides bodily experience into these different layers. Recently, I read this book, The Wakeful Body, Somatic Mindfulness as a Path to Freedom by Willa Blythe Baker. This book is the closest of any I've ever read in spirit to the goals of mindful biology. It's a very self-compassionate and loving approach to the complexity and beauty of embodied life. Well, Willa Baker 
is an American who has spent a great deal of time in Tibet, including doing some uh, very long retreats and becoming ordained as a Lama in the Tibetan Buddhist tradition. I learned from her that within Tibetan Buddhism, there are certain sects that make use of the yoga system of koshas mentioned earlier. And she uses a modification of that system as the basis for her book. I'm going to follow her example and emphasize four of the koshas. I'm going to use my own terminology because of my biological uh, emphasis. And there are also some other differences between how I'm organizing bodily experience compared to what she offers. But the general idea remains the same, and I owe her a, a big debt for helping to clarify mindful biology for me. So I'll be using a notion of bodily experience that consists in part of an object body, a mammal body, a cell body, and a universe body. I'll briefly describe what these involve now, and then we'll spend the rest of the five sessions exploring in more detail. So the object body is the one that the objectifier develops for us. So it's all of our ideas and notions and concepts about the human body and particularly our own body. The mammal body is, as mentioned, our body of direct felt experience with all the urges and drives and hungers and pleasures, etc. The cell body is a more fine-grained and subtle experience of pure aliveness that I tend to think of as relating to uh, the cellular activity that is spread throughout the entire body, but other traditions often talk about as an energetic flow, such as of chi or prana. And the universe body is the one that develops as we begin to feel our embeddedness in the biosphere and the cosmos at large. A nice meditation can be developed as a starting point from the first three of these bodies. So we can line them up and I encourage you to move through first all of your ideas about your body. You could sit in front of a mirror or just imagine yourself uh, in front of a mirror and you must have you know, looked at your body countless times and you have lots of ideas about it, its health issues, its uh, strengths, its blemishes, and just notice how many thoughts and ideas and concepts you have about the body as if it were a sort of object separate from this vaguely defined sense of yourself, this thing you call me or I. Then, after working with the objectified body, feel the subjective experience of the actual flowing, you know, digesting, breathing body. So you can feel the breath moving in and out. You can feel hunger or thirst. You can feel pleasure, discomfort. You can feel pressure points, etc. You can feel the body as a living phenomenon directly. And then move to just the diffuse sense of vibration or warmth or presence or aliveness that lets you know that you are in fact living, that you have this living body and that every part of it is somehow alive and connected. So that's another meditation suggestion to be pursued after this series. But moving back to the four bodies that we'll be working with, I want to point out that they differ in an important way. The two on the left that we tend to spend a lot of time in contact with, the object and mammal bodies, tend to be the layers of experience or the channels that cause the most suffering. So we might have some idea that we're not as attractive as we'd like or as we used to be, and there will be some suffering that comes from that objectified perspective. Or we might feel a pain in our body that we could feel some resistance toward, again, causing suffering. Well, the two layers or channels on the right, the cell and universe body, differ in that they 
tend to be more stable and unchanging. So the feeling of pure aliveness doesn't change much as we age, nor does our embedded sense of being part of the cosmos. It's not dependent on our age or health. It's just a fact of ongoing existence. So those experiences are much more stable and they're sources of equanimity. And because of that, it can be really helpful to get more in touch with the so-called cell and universe body experiences because they can provide a backdrop of stability as we deal with the more changeable aspects of our conceptual and mammalian lives. So let's go to that conceptual body, the so-called object body, and take a little bit more of a look at it so that we can understand it better. We have to start here rather than moving straight to the more equanimous channels uh, in order to be sure that we're honoring our bodily experience and not simply rejecting it or trying to escape it. So we want to really be sure that we're in touch with all layers of body experience, not simply you know, jettison some in favor of others. Now the object body is one that actually is the one that constitutes most of our bodily experience. Even when we're in touch with a felt experience within the body, we often have so many thoughts and concepts swirling around that those are what really constitute the bulk of our experience of the body. So the object body is the one that's developed for us by this objectifier function of the brain, this characteristic skill of the human mind of picking out features in the environment, naming them, and analyzing them. And of course, the body is an important feature of the environment, and our objectifier function picks it out, gives it this name, body, and then starts to build up a lot of ideas and concepts around it. Something that happens quite frequently, in fact, almost inevitably, is that some kind of metaphor becomes applied to the body. Very often in our culture, the body gets referred to as a machine, sort of like a vehicle, an automobile that moves us through life. It's not at all uncommon to pe for people to talk about the body in machine-like ways. And this perspective is emphasized when we go to a clinic or a hospital and the organism is hooked up to various monitoring leads, much the way our automobile gets hooked up to uh, the computers in a shop and its error codes, codes are read out, etc. So the machine perspective has been part of biological uh, understanding for a long time. After all, modern biology started to develop uh, you know, pretty early in the Industrial Revolution, and there has always been a tendency to apply machine metaphors to the body and to life. And they are useful. They help us look at component parts and see how they work and function in isolation and how they function together. It's a useful metaphor. However, it's a little bit hazardous when applied to our own personal body because the body inevitably wears down with age. Now, if we buy a machine like an automobile and it wears down with age, we're tempted at some point to replace it with a new machine, to buy a new car. Of course, that's not an option with the human body, at least you know, not at the present time. And so if we watch the body deteriorate and we think of it as a kind of you know, unfeeling machine-like thing that's simply wearing out, this can be quite distressing. So what can we do to improve on this metaphor? Well, one thing that's helpful is to bring a clear biological perspective to bear, to at least have an accurate understanding of what the skin is doing for us, all the benefits that it offers, even as it ages. You know, this is using the skin as an example, but the entire body is similar. You know, if we understand the body well, then even if we have a machine-like metaphor for it, at least we'll be less dismayed by its changes. That will move us a little bit away from the suffering that the objective view of the body tends to generate. But a 
even more effective step is to switch metaphors away from the idea that the body is a mechanical device, a machine, and instead to look at it as a living, sensitive being, an animal that is warm and supportive and nurturing. With a metaphor like that, we can allow the body to age without feeling like discarding it. When we feel more connected with the body, more supported by it, and more affectionate toward it, we will automatically feel a lot less suffering as it inevitably changes. After all, when an animal that we love, such as a horse or a cat or a dog, when such an animal or even a person ages, we don't feel like discarding them. If anything, we love them more. We cherish them more. So, of course, an animal metaphor will be more healthful and supportive. I would even say it's more empowering. To view the body as a fallible machine is inherently anxiety-provoking. To view it as an intelligent animal gives us a sense of power and confidence. So to begin to explore the body's intelligence, let's consider the intelligence of the skin, which after all is our focus this term. So the skin serves many important functions. It seals in moisture and vital resources in the body. The body has to maintain a certain water content and it's got lots of sugars and proteins that need to be kept in place and the skin serves the function of holding them in, which we know by looking at what happens when people have burns that are extensive or other problems with the skin. They have trouble maintaining uh, the moisture content needed in the body. They also have trouble with infections because the skin keeps bacteria and viruses out. It's not a perfect uh, barrier. Some can penetrate, but most of the time, if the skin is intact, we're pretty well protected from microbial invasion. So the skin protects us. It also regulates the interior milieu, particularly the temperature. So we have fat under the skin as part of it that serves an insulating function. Most animals have fur that also insulates. And then we have sweat glands and other mechanisms to dispose of excess heat, all in the service of thermoregulation. And of course, the body has a sensory capacity. It senses touch of various sorts. It senses vibration and texture, warmth and coolness, and so on. So the body is like this very intelligent living garment that provides all of these important services in order to favor our well-being. So another meditation that I would recommend as a practice is to accept the object idea of the body, to accept an objectified view of the skin, you know, temporarily, and look at it as this intelligent being, this biological surface, this garment of vast potential that seals, protects, regulates, and informs. So that rather than looking at the skin as something that we need to fret about and worry about its appearance and its changes with age, it can be something that we honor and feel reverence for and awe about as we understand how much it does for so long, from birth until the end of our life, the skin is there sealing, protecting, regulating, and informing us. That can be a very supportive and nurturing meditation, and I recommend it to you as something you might want to try. So this concludes our first of five sessions about sensitivity. We're beginning to explore the skin and the 
ways that it can be experienced in different channels or layers of embodied living. A lot was covered today and we'll continue to clarify and experience these different aspects of the skin and embodied life in the subsequent four sessions. I look forward to exploring this wonderful experience of the human body and the human surface with you.